Trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose, doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live Ninja Trader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. My name is Jim Cagnina with Ninja Trader. It is Wednesday, December 13th, 2000. 23 getting toward the end of the calendar year and what better way to end getting close to the end of the calendar year uh with our gr good friend great host great guest from the cme group i would like to introduce to you right now eric norlin is with us today from the cme group eric is uh managing director and senior economist at the cme group eric good morning good morning I Actually, good, good afternoon. afternoon. I'm in London, but yes. I see. Any rumors that you come, come into moving over to Chicago? Uh, no, no. I, I'll be staying here in London, but we will have uh, a new economist joining us in Chicago, hopefully at some point in the next, I don't know, month or so. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm actually going to be staying here in London. Oh, okay. Terrific. Terrific. I got to come out and visit one of these days. I've only been there once and I had a wonderful time when I was there. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, you know, this is, we're anticipating Chair Powell today, right? Yes. Last meeting, last dot plot, last meeting at calendar year 2023. We'll have four voting members, their last shot at the title before they're swapped out with four new voting members. Um, do we expect any surprise? Could be wrong, but I think it's very unlikely. Um yeah, I think that the Federal Reserve is probably just going to uh, keep policy on hold. Um, that seems to be the overwhelming view in the futures market. If you look at our Fed funds futures contract, it prices maybe a 3% chance that they move rates, 97% chance that they stay. Um, the only potential surprises are what Chairman Powell might say uh, during the press conference afterwards, if he's going to use this as an opportunity to shape expectations uh, for what the Fed might do next year. Okay. I see. Yeah. So that's a great, that, that, that's, that's some good insight. You know, we're talking on this side, it's like, Hey, is, you know, we talk in terms of hawkish or dovish comments, right? Is he, get, is he, yeah. is he going to be cautiously hawkish going into 2024? And is the marketplace going to just shrug that off? like it did last time he was that way. Yeah, I think it's likely. I mean, I don't, don't think a lot has changed since the last time that he spoke. Um, you know, we had another solid employment report. Uh, we've had another, you know, inflation report that showed that inflation is coming down, but it's still above the Fed's target. Um, so, yeah, I don't really see anything that's happened since his last outing um, that would really cause him to pivot one way or the other. So historically, so you mentioned the CPI report that we got yesterday, suggesting progress, but very slow progress, right? But in the right direction. Uh, historically, is this a case where we could expect that to continue? In other words, you know, yeah, we're going to keep making this progress, but it's going to take a long, long period of time. Yeah, I think we're actually making progress faster than most people appreciate. Um, if you look at the CPI report uh, from yesterday, um, the core inflation rate was still up 4% year on year, which is, by the way, not great. Um, but if you look at that number and you break it into two parts, so the six months from December 2022 to, uh, um, to I guess, May 2023, and then the second part from June uh, 2023 to November 2023, and you annualize it, what you find is in that first half, uh, of the year-on-year -year rolling window and infl core inflation is running at 5%. In the second half, it was down to 3% annualized. Um, so inflation is definitely coming down. Um, second thing about it is that the main reason why we're still up at 4% inflation on the core uh, is really down to one component. It's this idea of owner's equivalent rent, this idea that 
people who own their own homes rent their houses from themselves. By the way, they don't do. It's not true. Um, and so if you get rid of the imputed rent component, inflation is already back down to 2%. Um, so I think the Fed is cognizant of this. I think they, they look into the, into the details of the report, of course, and they know that the only inflation we're still having is really rental cost. Um, you know, everything else is very, very tame. Uh, most of the other inflation numbers were hugging 2%. Some of them were even negative, like car prices are falling, airfares are plunging. Um, there were a few other components like medical care costs that were actually down. Medical costs never go down. I couldn't believe they were down. Um, but um, you know, in general, inflation has been tamed. Um, I do think that the Fed is still going to be cautiously hawkish, though, for a different reason, uh, which is that they don't want to prematurely ease policy and then reignite inflation as they did on several occasions during the 1970s. Um, so they think they want to, they're happy inflation's coming down, they're confident of its direction, uh, but they really want to see it come down further and stay down before they really think about easing. So would, you, w would it be prudent to think that they might say, hey, we're going to keep Fed funds a certain spread above core PCE going forward? You know, I, that might be an interesting strategy for them, but I don't think they're likely to do it. They've never done anything like that before, and I'm not sure why they would start now. I mean, it may be a good idea, but um, yeah, I, I, I just can't imagine the Fed's going to make that sort of announcement today. Okay. All right. That sounds fair. Going back to the equivalent rent, though, and I know it's a big discussion point, and, and we've talked about it before, and I've talked about it with my colleagues before. Um, it seems to me there's all sorts of housing, just raw housing data, housing prices, rents that could be pulled and incorporated into that report instead. Why don't they just do that? Yeah, that's a good question. So historically in the United States, they have not done that. They've never used the purchase price of homes. Um, you know, and so they've always used um, they've always used rents. And so I think the reason for it is sort of a you know, sort of an economic and philosophical reason. Um, they want to measure the cost of housing as people experience it. Um, and so the thing is, like if housing, imagine how the price of buying a home goes up 20 percent. Well, that is a 20 percent higher cost for uh, people who are buying a home right now. But the number of people who are buying a home at any given time is really, really small. Um, if housing prices go up 20 percent, the real effect for most people who already own their own homes is, is just their the wealth increases. It doesn't mean they're spending anymore. Like if you own your own home and the price goes up 20 percent, that doesn't mean you're spending 20 percent more money. Obviously, your mortgage is going to be the same. Maybe you paid your mortgage off. Um, and so uh, they've always tried to do this through the rental market, um, yeah, which I guess in some ways makes sense. But the problem is that only a minority of Americans rent their own homes and most of them own their own homes. Um, and so then they take that sort of minority who's renting and then they impute that rent to the majority who are owning using the, using the owner's equivalent rent. And the last problem with this whole thing is that uh, rental costs tend to be a lagging indicator of inflation. Um, so you know, the real inflation that we had, um, everything else outside of owner's equivalent rent peaked, uh, was going up at a peak rate about a year and a half ago in mid-2022. At that time, rents were actually pretty calm. Um, we're dragging the index down lower. So it actually, you know, had we uh, gotten rid of owner's equivalent rent, then it actually would have showed significantly higher inflation uh, than was being reported at the time. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, mortgage rates have gone from 3% to 8%. Um, and so now uh, a lot of would-be buyers have been forced into the rental market. And so now finally we're starting to see rent soaring belatedly. And it's causing this inflation number to be sort of held up artificially higher um, than it really is for people uh, who are not renters. And hence the idea that, hey, let's take this out of the calculation and see what is left right on the table and use that as a measure to see, all right, what's, what's the more practical impact on the CPI data on uh, going forward? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, well, if you, if you do get rid of it, then um, you, you have a much lower inflation rate or an inflation rate of around 2% rather than 3 or 4%, depending on whether you're looking at the headline or the core number. Um, but going forward, though, um, you know, rental costs, the pace of increase crested this summer. Um, 
I think around May, June, it was growing at 8% year on year. Um, and in November number, it was down to a 6.7% growth rate, which is still very, very high uh, compared to overall inflation. Um, but the trend in rental costs, I think, is definitely uh, towards smaller and smaller increases. Um, I think that landlords have raised the, the rents in many markets to just about what the market can bear. Um, so if you look at big rental markets like New York City, rents are no longer increasing. Um, there may be some New York specific issues, too. But, um, yeah, there's... Uh, yeah, I think I think that you know the, a lot of people just are not willing or able to pay more rent than what's being asked at the moment. Makes sense. So let's pivot to this morning, right? We had in producer price index came out this morning. It seems to me that it's it's not as celebrated as CPI, but today's report came out and it seemed pretty good. Yeah, it was. It was uh, you know showing uh, you know X food and energy up two and a half percent year on year. That was below expectations. So it shows that kind of at the producer level, uh, prices are not really rising very quickly. And that is, um, that is good news. Um, you know, tomorrow, we're going to get out another sort of version of this, we're going to get the import and export price numbers. Um, those have recently been running negative year on year. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the trade blockages and supply chain issues that plague the economy a couple of years ago, those are all resolved now. Now, um, very few of those left. And, um, you know, it's, it's also reducing uh, the pressure on companies to reduce prices since their input costs are no longer rising very quickly. So if you look at the trends on some of these reports, would you say that we're kind of back to pre-COVID trends now? We're back on track? I'd say we're getting close. I'd say we're still a little bit above pre-COVID. Um, you know, pre-COVID inflation was very reliably at 2% for a quarter of a century. Um, at least at the core level. The headline number, out, of course, had some variation with food and energy prices. But um, yeah, the core number uh, was very stable at around 2%. Um, if I had to guess where we, where we really are, I would guess we're a little higher than that, maybe 2.5%, 3%, which again is a little higher than the central bank might like. Um, another reason for them to potentially remain um, a hawkish, at least in terms of their rhetoric, um, at least until they start seeing the... Uh, the whites of the eyes of a potential downturn in the economy, but so long as the data remain okay and they have been okay recently, um, I don't see any particular reason why they'd be in a rush to cut. Got it. And, and going forward, so you know, we track crude oil prices, copper prices a lot in the day in, in our early morning shows, and we think of that in terms of you know what 2024 what you know what are we looking at in terms of potential recession what are these numbers telling us and then how is it reflected into the next print right with the headline print presumably being a lot smaller because of energy prices being so much lower and what's what's going to what's you know what's the impact at the FOMC yeah, so the FO, uh, first of all, I think that the FOMC pays very, very little attention to energy prices. They assume that they're mean reverting. Um, yeah, so if energy prices plunge, for example, uh, you could argue, I mean, in some cases, maybe that affects monetary policy, like energy prices uh, fell 70% between late 2014 and early 2016. Um, that probably dramatically slowed the pace at which the Fed was increasing rates at that time. Uh, we haven't seen any drop that dramatic recently. We've seen more like a 10, 15% slide at most in energy prices. Um, but uh, you know, for them, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, when energy prices fall dramatically, um, it's obviously bad for the energy producers. They may start laying off staff. It's great for the inflation numbers as the inflation number goes down, which can take some pressure off the Fed. On the other hand, uh, when lower when energy prices fall, it, it increases consumer well-being and consumers usually within a few months go out and start spending that money on other goods, uh, which can be inflationary outside of energy. Um, so uh, I think that the Fed kind of views lower energy prices as a double edged sword. And they view higher energy prices the same way also as a double edged sword. You know, if energy prices soar, um, you know, the, the monetary policy authorities think to themselves, well, this could be temporary. Um, it increases the well-being of the you know, oil producers who may hire a little bit more staff, but usually that's very marginal in terms of its impact on the economy. But it reduces consumer well-being and you know, could potentially um, you know, slow down consumer spending on everything outside of, um, outside of gasoline station sales. Um, 
And so, you know, th for those reasons, the, the Fed doesn't typically react too much to movements in energy. So it seems like it's, it's you mentioned it. It seems like you, the human condition is you get a dollar in your pocket, you're going to spend it somewhere. Right. Whether it's on energy, if you, if you don't have to spend it on energy, you can spend it on something else. And that's going to you know, shoot more money into the system. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, basically, if your cost of energy plunges, um, you really have two choices. You could, as you say, go out and spend it on something else, which is generally speaking what consumers do. Or you could invest the money. Uh, but you, you put it, putting it, say, in a savings account, in which case the bank lends it out, it becomes investment that also adds to GDP. Um, you know, or you could put it in the, you know, into like the equity market or something like that, which means if you buy shares, somebody else has to be selling them. So they take that money and invest in something else. Um, so, you know, either way, it kind of stimulates growth. OK, so I'm just going to pop up uh, a, a monthly E-mini S&P chart on the screen really quickly. You know, and, you know, a lot of conversation about when are we going to have all time highs and all that stuff. I know it's very hard for you to see this, but, you know, we're, we're, we're moving. We've already kind of unretraced from our big drop. And, uh, you know, the question is, at what point does some of this money start getting funneled back into the equity market? And could it happen in a, in, it, with interest rates still being this high? Yeah, I mean, I guess, well, I guess anything is possible. I mean, if we get really Goldilocks numbers, um, you know, very tame inflation numbers, but still have some growth in the economy and corporate profits, that would be sort of the ideal environment for equities. Uh, it could potentially lead them to break higher and break through their old record high from the end of 2021 to, or the first days of 2022. Um, but, you know, it is, uh, it, it's a tough call, you know, it's also possible. And I think, in, you know, in my view, likely that uh, the Federal Reserve, as well as many of its peers around the world may have over tightened policy. Um, and that may lead to an economic slowdown in 2024. Um, in which case, that would probably not be brilliant news for corporate profits. And you have to remember the last two, uh, the last two, uh, you might call endogenous economic downturns as opposed to the exogenous shock of COVID. Um, the, the recession in 2001, as well as the global financial crisis, we saw the S&P go down 50% in the first case and 60% in the second case. Um, yeah, so the market can react very, very badly uh, if corporate earnings start falling because of economic. So does that then put pressure on the Fed to cut rates, you know, quicker. It may, yeah. I mean, they don't seem like they're in the mood to do any preemptive rate cuts because they don't seem to believe that there is very much risk of a recession. Um, they are seeing inflation abating, as we've discussed, uh, but they're not really seeing a lot of other weakness. Like the most recent retail sales number was pretty strong. Um, we get retail sales again uh, uh, tomorrow morning, um, you know, for the month of November. Um, you know, the expectation is the number is going to be pretty neutral, maybe slightly down month on month. It would not surprise me, however, if that number surprised a bit on the high side for a simple reason. Thanksgiving this year was exceptionally early. It's on the 23rd of November, which means Black Friday was also, by definition, early, the 24th of November. Uh, we basically got an early start to the Christmas shopping season compared to last year um, when Thanksgiving was on the 28th of November and Black Friday on the 29th. Um, so it, it, we might see an upside surprise tomorrow in retail sales. Um, that would also just reinforce the, the Fed's view that, well, you know what? Um, inflation may be abating. Yeah, having an inverted yield curve is risky. Um, you know, having rates where they are is maybe maybe a big shock. But for the moment, the data are coming in quite strong, um, which I happen to think personally is a very myopic viewpoint. Um, I think it ignores the length of the lag times between when the Fed moves policy and when the economy reacts. Um, in my estimation, based on a wealth of historical data, that lag can be as long as two years time. Um, so the fact we're seeing strong economic data uh, a few months after the, you know, the end of parent end anyway of a, a tightening cycle is hardly surprising. Um, but it could lead to, to real problems down the road if the Fed you know, doesn't think about acting preemptively. But they don't seem like they're in the mood to do that right now. Yeah. 
So talking about lag times, um, you know, we, a lot of times we look at the, the, the inversion of the yield curve as an example. Um, and we look, you know, we use the CME Group's micro uh, 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 yield contracts to do that. We, you know, we look at the, ten, the two and the 10, and that inversion seems to be getting bigger over the last month or so. Is that just because of, you know, bad auctions on the long end of the curve or what's happening there? So you know, basically, we have the sharpest inversion of the yield curve since the very beginning of the 1980s. Um, and in the beginning of the 80s, as, as you may remember, we were, we were probably kids at the time. I was a kid. Uh, we had what at the time was the deepest economic downturn since the Great Depression. Um, unemployment rose from 5.5% in 79 to, to almost 11%, 10.8% by the end of 1982. Um, yeah, when it comes to the yield curve, you're right. We have this massive yield curve inversion, really inverted. Then it was actually kind of uh, coming out of its inversion until... Um, I'd say maybe the end of October. And then since uh, through November and early December, it's had a massive reinversion of the yield curve. Um, yeah, the lag time between the shape of the yield curve and the economic response, um, if you look at the sort of correlation between GDP growth and shape of the yield curve, the strongest relationship is after about two years. So the yield curve started to invert at the end of last year. Wouldn't surprise me if the economy kept growing throughout much of 2024. Uh, but as we get towards the end of 2024 and we get into 2025, uh, the risk of a recession might really begin to multiply. Um, we might even have some risk of a recession as early as the second quarter of 2024, but I think it will grow as we get into the second half and as we get into early 2025. Um, so when you look at the stock market, what does that mean for stocks? Well, you know, the stock market sometimes peaks really just before a recession begins. Like um, the National Bureau of Economic Research officially dates the recession that we now call the global financial crisis to December 2007. The equity market peaked out in October 07. Uh, so it peaked out like a month and a half, two months before that recession began. Um, so, you know, the equity market can also sort of like the Fed, you know, be sort of myopic in a sense. It's only focusing on the incoming data, the incoming profit numbers and not really looking at what the consequences of of all this monetary tightening are. Um, you know, and just for emphasis, the Fed just finished, we think. And we don't know for sure if it's done, but, you know, it seems to have finished the Biggest tightening cycle since 1981, 525 basis points of hikes. It's 100 more basis points uh, than it had done uh, you know, leading up to June 2006, which was the end of that tightening cycle. Um, that time it did 425 basis points. And you know what? For the next 18 months, the economy kept growing. Uh, it was not until December 07 that the recession began. And they had stopped hiking in June 06. Um, so that's how long the lag times can be. Well, and it's, you know, the, the counter of how long were interest rates at zero twice in the last 15 years, many of those years, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, interest rates, you know, were at zero from the end of 2008 to the end of 2015. Um, then they raised by a quarter. You know, so they were practically at zero until the end of 2016. And they did eventually get up to two and three eighths. But then in 2019, even before the pandemic, the Fed had cut them down to one and five eighths, and then of course slashed it to zero and left it there for another two years at the during the first two years of the pandemic. Um, yeah, so with this sort of brief uh, warming period um, in the uh, yeah you know, around like 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, we've basically been in like a 15 year long interest rate ice age, and now suddenly all the ice is melting. Right. And so when I, when I look at that stats and I look at the Fred chart, you know, we've all seen the Fred chart. Those are great charts. And it just seems to me that there's a, there's a case to be made that the effective Fed funds rate should stay you know, along its 35-year average of about 4.91% for a long period of time in the, going forward. Well, you know, it's tough. So what to me is very interesting is this. So for 40 years, we were in a downtrend in interest rates from the beginning of the 80s to uh, the beginning of 2021. So, yeah, you could calculate an average, but the average isn't very meaningful because the slope was down. 
I mean, mm-hmm. during that time, the Fed did six tightening cycles, um, but every peak in interest rates was lower than the previous peak, and every bottom was lower than the previous bottom. Um, and suddenly, we've broken that long-term downtrend in interest rates. We're suddenly much higher. Um, but what's really interesting to me is this: so this forty-year downtrend in interest rates coincided uh, with a forty-year-long ramp up of debt in the economy. Yeah, so in the early 80s, when we had 20% rates, at that time, the U.S. government's debt level was 30% of GDP. Now it's over 100%. Um, at that time, private sector debt added up to maybe 95% of GDP. Now it adds up to more like 150% of GDP. Um, so the question is, can we really have interest rates this high, given the level of debt in the economy? And what's really weird about this is that the level of debt in the economy is basically the same today, 250% of GDP between the public and private sector as it was in 2007. We never deleveraged. Uh, basically, they put rates at zero to allow us to keep this really high level of debt and not have to reduce the, the leverage ratios. Um, but you know, now that interest rates are suddenly at 5%, it's sort of like a test. You know, Can the private and public sectors finance this level of debt uh, without it creating problems? And the answer to that question may be no, but we may not uh, find out the answer for another year or two. So, but is this, is this why maybe we're seeing, you know, more and more four week, eight week bill auctions instead of successful 30 year? Well, so part of the reason for that is just because the federal government's budget deficit is so enormous. It's running around, you know, six, seven percent of GDP, even seven and a half percent of GDP. Um, it's just an astonishingly large budget deficit. Uh, we've never seen anything like this before when we've had low unemployment. You know, we have unemployment below four percent in the U.S. Normally, you would expect really small deficits. You'd be expecting a lot of tax revenue. And you would also be expecting uh, very little in the way of sort of like welfare payments or unemployment benefits uh, with that low level of unemployment. We have this mega budget deficit. Um, you look at the past peaks in in economic expansions in 2007, the budget deficit was 1% of GDP. When the economy peaked before the tech wreck in 2000, we had a 2% of GDP surplus. Uh, before the 1990-91 recession, even with all the Reagan deficits, you know, the Reagan-Bush deficit in like 89 was like 2.5% of GDP. We're at 7.5%. It's really astonishing. And so that's what explains to me this flood of debt coming onto the market. Wow. Well, that's, that's great, Intel. I really appreciate that. Last, uh, last question. Um, and again, this is, your, I'm going to ask you your opinion. And if you don't know, you don't know. But uh, if you don't have one, you don't have one. Um, from if if we don't have the soft landing, you have some sort of some level of recession. We speak this. Do you think this will be a longer lasting recession than previous years? Well, you know the thing is this. So if you're running a huge budget deficit going into a recession, it makes it harder to either cut taxes or raise spending, uh, which was a typical response to past downturns. So what does it do? If you can't cut taxes or raise spending. Uh, which they could do. They could blow out the deficits even bigger. Uh, but if you if they decide not to do it or they feel like they can't do it, the only option for supporting the economy is for the Fed to dramatically cut rates. Um, so yeah, right now the market's pricing up. Well, the Fed might go back to 3.5%, right? So we have a downturn. It might go way, way below that. You know, the last three downturns, um, even with all the fiscal support, um, the Fed wound up cutting rates by 500 basis points each time. Um, so you could see a lot more movements in short rates and the forward curve is currently pricing. Well, hopefully we don't get between that rock in a hard spot right now. But Eric, I want to thank you for being with us today. Our time is up. Greatly appreciate you being here. And I want to wish you happy holidays also, because we're probably not going to see it till next year. All right. Well, great seeing you. And I look forward to uh, 2024. Awesome. Very awesome. And everybody, I uh, appreciate everybody coming today to uh, see the futures. I do want to remind everybody, most important message of the day, please be safe out there. Be good to each other. See you soon.